Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everybody, depending on what time of day it is you're watching this video. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. This week, I'm going to be concluding the layout design project that I started two weeks ago. So without further ado, let's just get back into the design. I'm going to start with the lower scenic deck. Trains will arrive from the westmost point of the visible portion at Crescent Yard, passing the cement works. Now, since the client has the Valley Cement Works kit from Walters, I use those structures in laying it out. But there is plenty of space to do a much better job of a real cement works than the significantly compressed versions in the kit. So I've recommended that he gets a second kit and uses both of them to kit bash into a larger cement works. And also there is plenty of room for the spur tracks to extend through the backdrop to increase the capacity. And you'll notice that in every case, the hole is directly behind or within a structure. So you'll never be able to see the holes in the backdrop. I filled in all the industries along the east end of Crescent. As I mentioned earlier, they're all in the correct locations, although in most cases they are compressed. And other than Henson Lumber, I was not able to find out what any of them were called. So that is a research job for the client when he's ready to start building them. If you recall, I said there was three tracks in here. There was one long spur and two much shorter ones, which look as though at one point they might have served end loaders. Even though on close examination of the satellite photograph, they appear to be abandoned. So I have shown one abandoned track leading off the front of the fascia at this point. And although there is no obvious purpose for this track, I've labeled it as an off-stage industry. I'm thinking if he just models either a parking lot or a loading dock, the structure can be assumed to be in the aisle, and he can make that whatever kind of industry he wants it to be. We have this nice long scenic section running over the Mustang and Rock Creek bridges to the Primrose siding, which brings up the end of the lower deck. And you'll notice that there are no tunnels in this area. In every case, all three main lines just disappear into dense clumps of trees. There is, after all, a lot of tree cover in the area, thus making it really easy to disguise where the tracks leave the visible portion of the railroad. At this end, both of these helixes lead down to staging, as does the South East branch from Crescent, but I'll come back to that later. In the meantime, let's just head up this helix to the upper deck. Here we see the Fort Worth and Saginaw area in all its glory. The main line emerges from under a row of buildings, heads around the end of the peninsula into the yard. Now if we look at this red area, we've got a long row of structures that need to be above eye level, and they basically form a double-sided backdrop. Now notice how in many cases it's only an inch or two wide, which is plenty, it doesn't need to use up a lot of space. But by adding a lot of extra corners and making it wider in a few places gives us two benefits. Firstly, the apparent size of this row of backdrop structures is going to be determined by the amount of visible wall area. And with all these intricate corners, it greatly expands that area, therefore making it appear to be a lot more of a city than it really is. Not only that, but where we have the wider sections also gives you the opportunity to vary the height of it somewhat. In narrow areas, you have to keep it all the same height. Otherwise, whenever you can see an end wall, it makes it immediately obvious that it's too narrow. But if the taller end wall is also the wider one, it disguises that completely, making the subterfuge very difficult to detect. I fleshed out the Fort Worth industrial area with industries which do actually exist in Fort Worth, most of which look as though they either still are or were at one time served by rail even though in all cases, these industries are at the other end of Davidson Yard, now further to the east. We have the Producers Grain Corp. There were two or three large grain elevators in that area. I selected this one because it still has the rail sidings there. There should have been more of the expansion silos than I've drawn. Now, Superior Heat Treatment is one that I found. I don't know if that one was ever rail served, by this, but I've used modelers license to assume that it is. Um, Airco and Senecor I don't know what kind of industries they are, but I've called Seneca a manufacturing company and I've labeled that one Airco Chemical, giving us the opportunity to have some storage tanks and an extra car type for added interest. Because chemical tanks always add a lot of interest to an industrial area 
with their curved surfaces contrasting with the predominantly straight lines of the regular structures. And you'll notice that the tail tracks for the grain elevator extend a couple of feet through the wall. Even though we're no longer using this room, there's no reason why we can't just add a little bit of extra capacity in this area. Now the Davison Yard area, if we recall from the satellite photographs, we had the large engine shops between two sections of yard. In both cases, there are about five tracks wide. I have had to greatly reduce this area. As I said earlier, to model it full size would use up the entire room. And although there isn't a road overpass just to the east of the engine servicing facilities, there is one at the other end of the hump yard. So I've moved it here, giving us an opportunity to have the classification tracks and some of the engine service tracks disappear under it in amongst the buildings where it's virtually impossible to tell that they are actually single-ended tracks instead of double-ended. And then the trackage in front of the engine terminal is a double track main line, three arrival departure tracks and one thoroughfare track from which everything else branches off. We've got five tracks for classification. I added a couple of auto rack unloading tracks here. There are a few tracks on the south side of the main line in this area, but it was difficult to tell from the satellite photographs what they're used for. I did, however, see a couple of spurs further east, which look as though they may have been for auto racks. So I've just moved them here, giving him an opportunity to switch out one additional car type at this location. The east approaches to the yard should be straight. Unfortunately, we have to bend them round a minimum radius curve. Fortunately, the client was happy with me building all his turnouts with fast tracks, so I was able to use whatever size of, of turnout up was necessary to get everything to fit. And by the time it gets into the yard area, the radius has opened out somewhat, so the couplers should still work reliably. This area at the end, I've copied the highway overpasses as accurately as I can in the space available. We have East University Avenue passing under the tracks at this point, which is four lanes wide. And we have Old University Avenue running beside the Trinity River, which is only a two lane road, both below track level. And then everything else is either at or above track level. Now, some of these highway bridges were only one lane wide. Most were two or three. And in most cases, I've had to reduce the number of lanes. These at the back should be two lane connecting roads. I've had to cut them down to one but they'll be fairly close to eye level and obscured behind the truss bridge. So hopefully it shouldn't look too bad. And then the bridges in front of the track are kept at two lanes wide, so they look reasonable. This area here should be a parking lot. The Fairfield Inn and Suites is actually between University and Old University Avenues. I've moved it this side because it's a fairly distinctive structure for the area and there's room for it here. It's certainly a lot more visually interesting than modeling a parking lot. And it's also high enough to form backdrop. Which brings me to another point. You'll notice that I have not drawn any backdrops on this deck. That's because with the attic location, we have a few areas where we're going to have slanting ceilings coming down to just above track level. And we also have two large windows and the customer would like to leave some natural light. So what I've done is arranged an almost continuous row of structures and other features around the room that will help to disguise the walls, whereas you can just leave the window gaps open. Crossing over the bridge, we head into the Saginaw Intermodal. There should be a major junction just east of Trinity River. It's right under the junction between state routes 30 and 35, and there are rail lines leading off in about seven or eight different directions at this point. Unfortunately, there was no way to represent it. And the main line at this point continues east to Dallas. Whereas on the model, Dallas trains will just have to run past these Saginaw facilities. There's not a lot we can do about that. But on the plus side, it would keep our double track main line busy instead of diverting a lot of traffic onto a hidden route that we don't have space for anyway. Also in the intermodal yard, I've added some spur tracks. There are no single ended tracks in the real yard, but there were a lot more through tracks. And clearly with the shape of the room, there isn't room to add another pair of through tracks. But at least by having the two spurs facing in each direction, any train that's slightly too long for the yard can double over into one of the spur tracks without tying up a through track. He can also use them for setting out blocks of cars if he wants to. Now, continuing on, I've introduced a 
universal junction here, two long crossovers with a pair of double slips and a diamond in the middle. I've called this area Saginaw Junction because it's between the two Saginaw based yards. Now in reality, the intermodal yard and the grain elevator complex should be on different parallel routes, both heading towards the north. But once again, we have to compromise to fit into the room. So turning the corner, we head into the grain elevator complex. Now, as I mentioned earlier, all these tracks should be double ended, but we don't have room for them. We do, however, have enough space to put the correct number of tracks in front of the elevator. The satellite photograph appears to show three long storage tracks immediately in front of the silos with an overhead conveyor and a dump building which has three much shorter tracks running through it. And the elevator is divided into two separate structures with an overhead conveyor between them. And I have all the correct industries more or less in their correct relative locations even though they are a lot closer to the main line than they should be. And I added a spur track back here for one additional industry of the customer's choice. In this location, I've got Ventura and Holcher on the same spur, just as they are on the prototype, although I'm not quite sure what type of industry Holcher is or whether it's even rail served, but it is certainly alongside the same spur that serves Ventura. So I've assumed that it's gonna be a rail served industry. And Ventura is a large single story warehouse, which covers the access hole here and will need to be removable for access to maintain these turnouts in this area. And the other industry in this area is Saginaw Oil, although of course it faces the wrong way because this industrial spur should branch off the other side of the grain elevator. These industries here will have to be set a couple of inches higher to allow clearance for the main line as it drops below them into the helix. And obviously there's no tunnel in this location. I've had to put one in, but I have shown it surrounded by a dense grouping of trees so it should be fairly inobtrusive and there need to be some kind of retaining wall along here as the grain elevator is now on a sloping site. Again that can be disguised by trees and bushes in this area. So that just about completes the visible portion of the layout. Now let's head back down to the staging. On a railroad designed for operation simply doesn't work without staging. Here is the completed staging deck. As I mentioned earlier, there are quite a lot of complicated connections necessitated by the client's desires. This single track helix is coming down from Cresson. I traced that route on the satellite photograph and it went to Granbury, Dublin and a few other places. No major cities in that area, but a lot of smaller ones. We have seven tracks in this location. And then to ease in turning trains between sessions, they're all double-ended, they join again to a single track, and there is a reversing loop under the central peninsula. The other end of the main line comes down from Fort Worth and Saginaw. And as I mentioned earlier, we've got the bottom half of the helix unwrapped into a ramp which runs around the entire room, turns back on itself, and then we have a nine-track staging here, which I've called Oklahoma and Dallas, because Oklahoma is north, Dallas is east, although, as I mentioned earlier, the Dallas trains should ideally be leaving the visible portion a little earlier than they actually do. Then we have the same arrangement at the other end. The staging tracks are all double-ended with a loop line underneath the Crescent Helix. And then the two tracks that come down underneath the Fort Worth Helix, the outer one runs into five staging loops representing Cleburne. I'm not sure if I pronounced it correctly. With a cut-off track shown as connection F, heading back to Cresson allowing the customer to be able to run continuously before he builds the upper deck. That's the only way of doing that. Once the upper deck is complete, that cutoff track will no longer be required because he will already have two continuous circuits elsewhere. And then as I mentioned earlier, connection D, this inner loop around that helix, joins up with the north and eastbound tracks to complete the second continuous circuit. And there's one more connection down here, connecting the Dublin loop with the Oklahoma Dallas staging, just in case he needs to run single directional traffic, such as open top cars. I don't know if there are any cold rags in this area. As I said earlier, I wasn't paid to do a lot of extra research, but just in case he wants to do that, this track will allow them to return to the correct staging yards for the next session without having to run them the whole length of the main line. There are a few optional crossovers that I included on this plan, just in case he wants to add them. Now in this area here, I needed the one crossover 
because I wasn't able to get it any closer to the yard without compromising the minimum radius. So I had to go in here where the curve opened out a bit. But by adding a crossover in the opposite direction, it has the opportunity to bypass the yard on the other main line, just in case he ever gets fouled up and he has to temporarily park a train on the second main. And then there's another pair of optional crossovers on the lower deck. They're not strictly speaking needed for operation, but it does increase flexibility with the long approach to the Dallas and Oklahoma staging yard. Now all the way from the upper deck down to the staging yard is a very long run, half of it on the helix and half on the opened out ramp track. Now obviously these crossovers don't represent any actual location on the prototype, so I've called them Tipperary Junction based on the lyrics of a very old song, something about being a long, long way to Tipperary. When I did an online search, it came up with a town in Southern Ireland, which of course is a long way from Fort Worth, Texas. So I think it's appropriately named. And there's one other thing I'd like to point out before moving on. Where the lower level backdrop reaches the front of the layout, it joins with the fascia at both ends, but I've shown how there is room for a pair of helix viewing windows meaning that trains don't disappear for a long time in the helix. It's easy for the operators to keep an eye on them without having to resort to video cameras and closed circuit TV. It's not always possible to do that, but in this case, it was a pretty simple matter to incorporate that functionality. Now, there was one thing that the client wanted to improve on this design. We look at this corner of the room here. He wants to go back to his architect and find out if this dormer can be increased to virtually the full width of the room so that these two tracks can join up with each other. Now we don't know just yet whether that's going to be possible or not, but while we're talking about improving the room, I also suggested that these corners here could be cut off at 45 degrees, giving us a few extra inches in critical locations. And this knee wall along here is a lot taller than it needs to be. Unless there's some obstruction in the attic in this location, it is perfectly feasible to move it back a couple of feet to the point where it is at the height of the lower deck. And that will make it a lot easier to access the lower ramp track. Let me go back to that view. This track here and Tipperary Junction will be a lot easier to access if this knee wall is moved further down the pitch of the roof. It would save the complexity of having removable scenery in this area and of reaching through the helix to maintain these turnouts. So while we are requesting modifications from the architect, we've asked for that as well. Well, I think that just about covers everything for this layout, at least for the time being. There will probably be an update in a few months time. But until then, thanks for watching and I'll see you again next week. Bye for now.